Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we are joined by returning guest, Jim Padilla, the co-founder and CEO of Gain the Edge. Jim is a master at growing companies, creating wealth, and honoring God through his work. Specializing in million-dollar sales strategies, Jim and his team provide top-notch sales solutions, helping businesses scale effortlessly. At Gain the Edge, they offer proven sales systems for business owners ready for exponential growth. I've asked Jim to join us here today to share his story, plus tips on growing a business hands-free and focused on our genius zone. So Jim, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, man. So good to, to connect again. Yeah. Yeah. It's an honor and a pleasure. For those that don't know your background, how did you even get into this? Is this a family trait? Are you following in your great grand, your father and your great grandfather's footsteps? No, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, because it is my path. My, my family knew nothing of entrepreneurship and business. My family was very typical of got to do it the hard way. You, you right. just got to work. You got to save your scraps. You got to get what you get because everything else is a privilege. And I grew up my mom was a teenager. Dad was a teenager when I was born. They had no clue what they were doing. My dad took off. My mom was did best she could with what she had, but she was not equipped. And I took the brunt of it, a pretty mm. severely challenged, abused youth, ended up in foster care as a teenager and on the, on the streets and gangs and in jail by 19. And everything I got, I didn't even know that there was a possibility of work. Of abundance wasn't a word in my life. I didn't even know mm. that was a thing. And I just knew that the world was what was in front of me and I had to do everything I could to survive it, which meant lie, cheat, steal, take advantage of people, learn how to read the room so I could take from everybody else, learn how to bend will and influence in my direction, because that was how you stay alive when you're in, in on, on the streets or in jail. So I didn't even know that there was this whole other world of service and abundance and doing good things for people. Can you describe that? So people might be feeling that man, maybe they have been in jail, maybe not, but just people that are in that mindset. What can you, what does that world look like for someone that's never been there? You, you get to a place where I think everybody, the only thing you really know is the life you have. So I thought I used to get my ass kicked every day. I just assumed everybody else did too. I didn't even know it was a thing. So I just thought it was normal. I didn't know that there was an actually a different life. But then when you start seeing that people do things different because you hang out at your friend's house and you, their parents treat you with love and difference, you start recognizing that there may be something wrong with me because how come I have this weird life that my friends don't have? So mm -hmm. then I started not, you learn to start creating these identities to survive in, in the environment. When I was at home, I was trying to make sure that I was not an intrusion to my mother so that I wouldn't be some reason to get beat. And when I was at school, I tried to pretend I had this awesome home life that I didn't have. And so I, I, the whole thing was I lost me in the process. I had no idea who I was or who I was trying to be because I spent all my time trying to be these other things to these other environments. And it just creates a very confusing life. And you just learn to just live with what you have. So what does it look like to be in abundance for someone? Like for someone that's on that side, looking over from the outside, and what's it like on the inside? What's the flip? The one thing that I really gained that I did learn is I've, I don't have resentment and anger for my childhood. Sometimes I have a lot of empathy for that five-year-old kid that went through stuff he shouldn't have had to, but all this stuff was a gift. All these things were what taught me how to read the room, reflect back to people what they need, learn to serve people, even though I learned it from being selfish, it ended up gain, giving me a massive gift because now I know I've learned that the more people I serve, the more pe more things, the more wins I gain in my life. And as I matured and became a God-fearing Christian in a role with Jesus, I see that as that was that's God's currency. That's God's economy. The more you serve, the more impact you make in the world. Right. You know, he says it right in scripture that it will come back to you. And so I, I just didn't know that. I learned it all the hard way. And so you start recognizing after a while that it doesn't have to be as hard as you make it, or if it is hard, it's because there's something great on the other side, as mm -hmm. opposed to it's just hard. When you and to, that's where to me that's where abundance starts beginning is because you start recognizing everything is for your benefit. Then no matter what it is, instead of going why is this happening, you go, okay, what am I supposed to gain or learn from this so I can move through it quicker? Mm -hmm. I never was in the military or a police officer, but I think I would have been good at it because my instinct is to run towards danger. When stuff <laughs> happens to me, I just go, oh, here we go again. I just lean in. Yeah. Like, what's going to be, because I've learned so many times that this stuff is not going to kill me, is designed to launch me into something else. Mm. You just I, have to be able to endure the pain. I, I, I really believe 
I really believe in that. I, there's a line from one of Kanye West's songs, everything I'm not made me everything I am. And I've always loved that because that's, that's a real part of it. I feel, and with your comment about if it's hard, you have to be careful that it's hard because there's something great on the other side, not that it's hard because you're doing the wrong things. I think right. that I had this thought a couple months ago, I was thinking about all that's happening in the world right now. And some of this really seems evil. Some of it seems well-intentioned, but misguided. And I thought to myself, I don't think it's that good beats evil. I don't think it's a battle of good and evil in that sense. I think it's almost like when you look at a plant and it grows and as it's growing flowers and branches on it die, as it keeps growing, I felt like good just outgrows evil. Cause when you look at all these evil things, they're very much self-sabotaging and stagnating things. And I, I have nothing against anyone's sexual orientation by any means, race, whatever. I don't care what you do behind closed doors, as long as it doesn't involve children, as long as it's between two consenting adults, whatever. But I know that religion typically doesn't like uh, homosexuality. I realize it's because there's no offspring. There's That's a dead end road. So it's not that so much it's evil, but it's just, you can almost say instead of good and evil, it could be growth versus dead end. If you categorized it instead of like good and bad, you're like, this is going somewhere and this is going nowhere or a karma, right? This yeah. is going to come back in the future and you're not going to like it. And this is going to take you to the path that you want to be on and like less friction. You're not going to cause problems for you tomorrow, today. And I, I felt like that might be the dichotomy, so to speak, to a certain extent. Anyway, just a thought that I had, because when you said that, because yeah. it doesn't mean everything's going to be easy. Correct. But if you're on the right path, there is a beautiful oasis for you on the other side of that mountain you're trying to climb. Yeah, it's interesting because there's so many different, I'm going to have to think on your metaphor. Uh, yeah. around outgrowing versus good and evil. Cause I, I, I like that because there is truth in that. Um, but as I was saying that in my head, truth is like the whole good versus evil piece, there's truth and everything else. And the truth is designed to go someplace specific and everything else is not, which means by default, it's a distraction to where you're, where the intended outcome is. So if truth is wholeness, so tr when, when I'm at hundred percent truth, that means I'm in alignment. I'm right. I'm doing my purpose. I'm in line with, I'm aligned vertically and horizontally. I'm connected with God and I'm serving people and I'm doing the things. And anytime I start straying from that, then it just starts taking me off track. So I'm no longer in alignment with truth. I'm now off track. I'm distracted. I'm doing things for selfish motivation, or I'm doing this to solve for the world instead of for the greater good or just whatever. It's, so it's a similar metaphor, right. right? But it's, it's, what are we standing for? And I do, what I've learned in the world, I, I have learned that entrepreneurship and business in general is because I read so few entrepreneurs that don't have some ulterior motive to what they're doing. Right. Like they, they, they're not just selling a widget. They're trying to change lives for people. If you're remodeling, we have a, somebody that we've been talking to who's they remodel homes, but they don't care about the remodeling homes. They're trying to in, in, install the greatest family experience that can be. Mm. And this is the mechanism in which right. they do. And the way I see that is, again, going back to that whole truth metaphor, before, like all we're doing as entrepreneurs is restoring people to wholeness. And right. this is the happens to be the vehicle in which we do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. That's Elon Musk says all the company is is a group of people who solve the pain of another group of people via a product or service. And I literally just got off of a Zoom call with Michael Gerber, author of The mm. E-Myth, before hopping on here with you. And what he was talking about is exactly what you're talking about. So few people are in business for a, a cause greater than themselves. A lot of them are just trying to make ends meet for the end of the month type thing, as opposed to having something that they want to contribute to the world, having some sort of vision where the, the business of today is just the mechanism to do it. And I think that's really important because I say this a lot on my show, but one of, one of my favorite tidbits that I've heard is markets are unknown and unknowable. If I asked you how many people today are in market to buy a car, there's indicators, keyword searches, foot traffic, but ultimately we don't know and it's unknowable and it's constantly right. in change, but everybody can acknowledge and recognize excellence. Yes. So if you pursue excellence, the technology can change, the tactics can change, the strategy can change. But if you're pursuing excellence at solving that problem, that will see you through industry changing technology. It'll see you through economic cycles. It'll see you through tough, thick and thin. So, yeah, it's interesting because clarity of purpose and direction is one of the strongest skill sets uh, that you can have and one of the greatest tools in your toolbox. 
that you can have as an entrepreneur. It really is like a simplifying instrument in and of itself, because when you are sold out to a purpose, when you get to a place, we talk often about this aspirational journey that we take people on. And when you come into our world, you're, you're inspired. You're like, oh, I think that could be possible. I might be able to scale my company and be exitable. But then, and then it's, that's inspiration. And then aspiration is you start seeing when you, the longer you're in our world, you start seeing not just, is it possible, but it might be possible for you. Mm. And then that starts moving you towards ownership of the dream. And then at some place you reach a tipping point and you hit expectation. So you go from inspiration to aspiration to expectation and expectation is the juice. Expectation is when you say, okay, I no longer see this as possible. I see this as something I must do. Mm. And when I must do it, I've left out, it can't be done. And yeah. now I get creative. I get certain. I start attracting opportunities. Doors start opening. Things happen because expectation is the secret sauce towards dream, towards inspiration, towards desire, towards imagination, towards all the things that can happen. But if you don't expect it, then you're not actually going to achieve it. Very yeah. few people. You'll have incremental growth. You'll never get, it's, it, it's a weird math formula because when you get to inspiration and aspiration, you'll make small moves and you'll make small growth. But the moment you start hitting that expectation, because you just, somehow this is going to be doable. Mm. And then all of a sudden you have these, you don't go by 10%, you double your business, mm. you 10 X your opportunity, mm. you get an opportunity or an offer or a partner or something that all of a sudden opens the door to things you didn't even know were real. Yeah. Yeah. They used to call it I, and I've seen, that's been my life, dude. That's been my whole life. Yeah. Yeah, they call that, Dan Kennedy calls that the phenomenon. When you achieve in 10 months more than what you've done in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's a new reality. So now you don't even know that the old was there. Right. And it's easier to main, it's easier to maintain something once you get there. The hard work is in getting there. And so you do that and then you maintain it. It's, I think that's really powerful. Would you say that's a big part of sales as well as clarity, helping people define clarity of purpose and direction when you're- It you is, know? man. Uh, I, I'll be honest, uh, as a Bronx, Puerto Rican, grew up in the streets. The first time I heard somebody talking about visualization and dreaming and breath work and all kinds of weird, I'm like, what the fuck I are you talking work. about, dude? Yeah, yeah. That's not a thing. And uh, But yeah. the longer I've been around more successful people, it's a very consistent thread throughout. And I don't care what industry, the hardest of the hard guys the smartest of the smart guys, the coolest of the cool guys, the most athletic of the athletic, visualization, dreaming, purpose, there's something bigger moving them. Mm. And that's what drives everything. And the results happen. The dominoes start falling as long as you had them lined up correctly to start with. That's always the key. You still have to know what you're doing, but you don't have to know how you're doing. You don't have to have all the all of the all of the, the T charts squared and the, the hammers and nails lined up. You just have to know this needs to happen in order for me to make that work. Who can get? Who can I attract that will help me make this happen so I can go do that piece? Yeah, I think it also opens up uh, scarcity. It's hard to be creative and collaborative when you're feeling fear, anxiety, worry. Yeah, and that's part of I think a big piece of it too. Like you mentioned. The, the Latin, I think, of the word decide is to cut. Yeah. So when you decide, you cut away all other options. You just decide and you go. And so I think that, one, in leading a, a company, creating something, you have to have that clarity. But I, I guess I was asking about in helping companies grow yeah. their sales. Is that yeah. part of it? Yeah. That, that's So yes to what you're saying on that. And, and Usually companies will bring me in to do sales trainings. You know, we have, we install systems, grow sales teams, fractional. So there's a lot we do for scaling companies. But when people bring me in to do a training, I know most of the time they're expecting us to come in and we'll work on scripts and we'll work on overcoming objections and those things. And that's all great, but I don't, you can Google that stuff. You don't need me for that. What I do initially is when we come into a sales team, no matter what the size of the team, we capture testimonials, customer reviews. Um, mission and purpose, things that the company has accomplished, milestones, benchmarks and stuff. And then we gather all the sales team and all of the people involved and they start reading them and they start sharing them because they have to get recommitted and understand anybody who is sailing 
they already know how to sell. They don't need me to teach them how to sell. They need me to get them connected to why they're doing what they're doing and why it matters and why it's so worth fighting for. And when they start reading testimonials and they start reading, yeah, this five-star review from an exchange that Daryl had with this person and this thing and this company that changed their life or this family that got reunited, all this, and you're like, holy crap. We're impacting people. We're changing lives. We're changing business. We're doing things. Now they're getting reinvigorated, reconnected to why they were doing this in the first place. Right. From there, now we have people who are standing tall, their heads above the fray. They can make great decisions. And now we can start talking more tactics. Because right. from that level, you make wise tactical decisions. And below that, you're just making tactical decisions because you're trying to survive. Right. And, and too many times, that's the piece that's missing. And so it's like 90% of what we focus on is what's between the ears, what's in your heart, what's in your gut. And for a lot of people, they think that's, do I want to pay $30,000 for that? Am I investing $100,000 in that? No, you're investing $100,000 in the outcome because we're going to help your company make millions as a result. You don't have to worry about the X's and O's. Right. As the old saying goes, it's not about the X's and O's, it's about the Jimmy's and Joe's, right? It's you got to tap into the hearts of people and the minds and get them in connection uh, and alignment. Because when that happens, that's a person that can't be stopped. Now you just got to teach them any X's and O's, but you can't teach somebody X's and O's who doesn't have the clear path forward because they're going to be your minority performers. I I love that because we've all either had, if you're a parent or we've seen kids that are just natural born salespeople. Can I please, please, can we get a pool dad? Can we get a pool dad? Can we get a pool dad? Hey dad. Hey, can I get this? I really want this. Kids are so tenacious and persistent because they really want it and they really believe in it. And I think that's a really powerful, that, that enthusiasm. And you know, talking about genuine. more importantly, I think the one piece that's in that is not only do they believe in it, want it, they believe they're going to get it. So there's nothing in the way. Right. Whereas we do nothing but put obstacles in our way because we don't believe we're going to get it. So we find all the reasons why we won't. Yeah, that's really powerful. Fear kills more dreams than failure ever will. So many yes. people just shy away. A setback or two, and they just give up instead of keep marching forward. <laughs> now, I think part of this that we haven't mentioned that honestly does deserve some mention is sometimes salespeople are timid because the product or service they're selling sucks. And that's, there's no fix for that. There's no <laughs> fix for that, but making it better and investing the time, energy, and resources into having something that will get reviews rave, and raving testimonials. And I think right. that's a really important thing for everyone to understand. If you're starting out, just don't over, don't let people know, hey, this is a beta program. This is a beta project. I'm figuring it out. Set expectations. You don't have to be the best in the world at something. Just properly set people's expectations that, hey, we're working out the kinks on this. That's why you're getting a good deal. It's going to be more later or whatever that is. Is that fair? What would you say to that? Yeah, I, I agree with that. But I think a lot of that, first, my first, first of all, here's what I have to say. Sure. If you're in business because you're doing something, you're doing it better than somebody somewhere, right? So the fact is you're actually are better at this than you probably give yourself credit for. And that's part of how you're selling. So you're not selling it the way that you should. Most of the time you're selling it because you're romantically connected to this product that you created. And you think the product is the most important part of this process instead of the solutions and the outcomes that are provided, which is the only thing the customer cares about. Mm. And so you're so busy selling that it slices and it dices and it bakes and it flushes and it does all this stuff instead of saying your life will be better when this is solved. And I'm the expert of solving this. Right. So, and the how is irrelevant. Nobody cares. So stop sharing that stuff. Right. And the beauty of it is if they only need one real problem solved, then just solve that one freaking problem. People today are much more savvy or more importantly, I think they are more savvy. So they think they're going to make these great, amazing decisions and they don't want to be oversold and they don't want to be over promised. And that used to be a thing over promise under deliver. I, I've come to the conclusion of exactly promise and exactly deliver. If they want a out, an outcome, give them the outcome. They get way more credibility yeah. and fulfillment from that because they say, hey, he said he can do this. He did right. it. Now, what else can you do? Yeah, I like that. I always heard it as under promise, over deliver, but exactly promise, yeah, exactly correct. deliver is, is, I think. Yeah. You know. Dude, I, I read a, a, a study that was that Google and Zendesk, I believe, put together uh, several years ago, but they were, they talked about the metrics of surprise and delight and over delivery. And they were tracking, of course, who's got more statistics yeah, than yeah. Google, but <laughs> so they, they tracked thousands of businesses, whatever it was in a bunch of different 
KPIs uh, and intersection points of decision making for buyers. And the, the, th the thrust of the study was that companies are spending between 16 and 20 percent to surprise and delight and over deliver. Yet they were gaining a maximum of 11 percent in retention and ROI. So you were spending more than it was delivering in terms of, of retaining customers, because at the end of the day, while customers might appreciate surprise and delight, they really don't care. They want what they paid for. So stop making surprise and delight be the emphasis. If you're going to do surprise and delight, it has to be icing on the cake over and above you getting them what they paid for. That's an interesting point. So what would you recommend to someone who's starting out or struggling right now in terms of growing their company? trying to get sales, trying to figure out how do I, I guess there's two, maybe two audience listeners. One is the one that's just trying to, they're the sales rep. So they're just trying to get more sales. The other one is the person that's trying to scale sales. Yeah, definitely two different thought perspectives because before you can get to a place where you can see the exponential opportunities, you got to get above sea level. Otherwise you're just trying to get air. I can't just hire a team and... of a hundred salespeople. Come on, Jim. <laughs> I got so, a great idea. It's yeah. a million dollar idea. Here's what I might tip. I, I always end up going to the same place. If I'm talking to somebody who needs whoever, if you're listening and you need more sales, you just, you have to have sales in the door before you can do anything of power. Then you need to start thinking of what's the biggest problem you can solve. Not what's the smallest or the next problem you can solve. Not what's the easiest thing to sell. Cause there's no such thing. Price is relative. You'll struggle just as much. And you know, I know Daryl will vouch for this. It's just as easy to sell a hundred thousand dollar product as it is a hundred dollar product if you're selling it to the wrong people. And so you want to get to a place where what is the problem I can solve that would deliver a hundred thousand dollars worth of outcome for somebody and start selling that. And in the process, you can always make offers and downsell to your hundred dollar or a thousand dollar or five thousand dollar thing. But you always need to be in search of the person who has the hundred thousand dollar problem. Because that's going to bring the best out of you is going to put you in a position where you're not going to talk about all the stupid shit that doesn't matter, all of the fluff that's irrelevant because 90% of everybody else has the same fluff. You're going to talk about the thing you do different and better than anybody else. And you're going to know how to speak to the heart of the problem that these people have. And they're going to go, wow, I'm not even sure what he said, but I sure love the way he said it. I need to know more what this guy's talking about. And so get clear on solving big problems, selling big things, because the more profits you gain, the faster you get above sea level and you can breathe. And when you start breathing, you can see it better, more clarity and you can start making better decisions. Now you can start focusing on growing. I think that's Until really you get important. There, you're never going to grow. Yeah. The, trying to be the lowest price option is a kiss of death for most businesses. Totally. Yeah. Because you have less totally. margin. And if your only competitive advantage is price, there's nothing stopping the next person from coming in and offering less than you, even if they're suicidal, maybe they're suicidal. Maybe they're going to lose a ton of money, but they're going to upset your apple cart in the meantime if the only differentiator is price. And price isn't even the yes. number one thing for a lot of people. Price no. is like number nine on the list on the things that people care about. But I think the biggest thing is certainty of outcome. Certainty is everything. Mm. Certainty, certainty outcome. just write this down. And that's probably the, the most depth thing we're gonna share today. But whatever you're selling, if you think you're selling widgets, rooftops, plumbing, coaching, financial services. No, you're not. You are selling certainty. You are selling certainty that what you do will give them what they need. That is what you're selling. And that's the only thing you're selling. And the right. greater you sell that, the, and the more problems it can solve, the bigger problems it can solve, or the greater reason, the greater opportunities it's going to deliver for them, the greater pain it's going to free from them, the more it's worth. That's mm -hmm. all. That is the direct line. Right. Oh, right. I love that. I love that. I love it. So what are some of the specific skills and behaviors that you think are mission critical <clears throat> for business owners and sales teams? Mission critical is understanding of knowledge of where they're going. You are the expert of this journey. So you're the one who has to be able to map out the journey. Here's something that I believe is a challenge uh, that I, I try to challenge as many myths as I can. And one is that this, th I think there's something crazy that all every marketer on the planet says, you got to speak in the language of the buyer. You got to give them the ideal, the opportunity, let them put it into their words. Do you have any idea how few people really know what their problem is? And even fewer know how to actually articulate it. So they're going to be over here trying to self-diagnose something incorrectly. And then they don't have the vocabulary to even explain it to you. And you're over here trying to solve a problem that they don't even know is real. I love Instead this. of you knowing so clearly and so powerfully what their problems are that you can give definition and words to it so they can go, yeah, that's it. That's exactly what I was feeling. Here's one of two things that are going to happen. I'll, and I'll share here. Here's an example. 
We sell lifetime journeys. That's what we teach our clients to sell. We want you in our world masters of back end revenue because everybody's spending so much money and time and resources trying to get as much as they can from a CPM into a high ticket opportunity instead of recognizing that 90% of your total addressable market is on the back end, which means after their first opportunity to buy from you is where 90% of your revenue lives. And most of you have no way to get it because you're not doing anything about it. Right. So we are, and as a result, you're spending way too much money trying to acquire leads because the most expensive thing you're going to do is get them in the door. You're going to spend all your time, effort, and energy trying to find them, all of your credibility trying to convince them instead of selling to the people who've already bought from you, who've already been in your world because now they know what kind of expert you are. They know what you're capable of. They know what you can do. You've already spent money to acquire them. Now, every time you sell to them, it's going to be more profit, less client acquisition costs, less stress, less friction, more opportunity. You're, that is where you build your business on. Mm. But you have, in order to do that, you have to have clarity of where they should be going next because nowhere in the history of the world has there ever been a problem that brought a solution that didn't bring another problem. Whatever you solve for people, in our world, we help people make money. Once they start making money, they now need to figure out how to grow their company. They need to figure out how to hire their team. They need to figure out what kind of systems and stuff to put in. And guess what? We've got all of that. We help all of that occur, whether it is through the things that I do, the systems that we have, or the partners that we bring in. There's not a problem we can't solve while we're getting you to the mountaintop journey. But I, because we've been there so many times, I know every fucking pitfall you're going to have, and we've already got solutions tailor-made for that. When you know the journey, you just have to talk about the journey. Now, guess what you don't have to become? some kind of sales rock star. I'm not a sales rock star. I'm just really good at structuring our world in such a way that sales happen. Big I love difference. that. I love that. So as a practical example for someone that might be listening, first off, what he was saying is that prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. So first in your sales process, you have to help prescribe, diagnose what someone needs versus just tell them they need it because a lot of people don't even know what they don't know. Yep. And then after that, you're talking about lifetime journeys. I think a practical example for a lot of people is let's say someone installs pools. If you're getting a pool, maybe you need a fence. Maybe you need a maintenance package. Maybe you need landscaping. Maybe you need a patio built. Maybe you need swim lessons. Maybe you need to winterize the pool every year. Maybe you need to get the house appraised because it's got a new value and you're looking to get an RV and it, where's that money, right? So there's all these sequential things that happen. You solve the problem of I'm hot and I wish I had a pool for the kids to play in that. Now all these other options become available. And because you have the relationship with that person, there's no arm bending ninja five step close trick to it versus just being the person that they'll pick up the phone for when you call and just have a conversation with them and diagnose what other things they may need. Is that a fair assessment? Totally. And and then the longer you're in that, the more expansive and detailed that can become right. because every industry has a subculture. So let's say you are a pool, you're a guy who, who installs pools. I guarantee you're connected to investors right. and developers and fix and flippers or people who belong to vacation clubs. And the, it's what are the things you can do? All of a sudden there's, how do you start expanding that out? And you say, okay, people who are taking vacations to your neck of the woods, how can you be a resource to them? How can you be ambassador to their community? People who are buying, who people who invest in pools, who have, a, there's a difference between people who buy a house with a pool and people who invest in having a pool built. Right. right? A very small percentage of people buy homes with a pool and even smaller percentage install a pool. Now you start thinking of what other intersections of life do those people belong to country clubs? Do those people have kids in private school? Do those people, it doesn't mean they all do, but the right. likelihood they all have tendencies. The right. more you understand them, the more you can infuse your solutions into their world. Right. And it might not even be, maybe the only thing you do is dig ditches for somebody to put a pool in, but a yeah. hundred people who do all of the other things. And right. so now you can be a resource, which makes you a comfort necessity in right. their life, meaning it's necessary for them to feel good. You're on the speed dial. Right. And a lot of people feel like I can't do all that, but you, you can subcontract it out. You can get a referral. Oh, totally. fee. You can just do it for social credit with someone of influence that refers back to you. There's 101 ways. The only lack is your imagination for how you can benefit from that. And I think that's a really mm. powerful, important point to make. What are I used to, oh. uh, yeah, I, another example I, I used to, when I was in mortgage back in the early 2000s, we had, we had Sacramento carved up into four grids and I used to do home buyer workshops, one in each grid every month. 
So I would do every weekend I was doing one, Northeast, Southwest. And in each grid, I had a team, realtors, appraisers, home inspectors, mortgage and title companies. All I did was the loan. We would do home buyer seminars. We'd put 50 to 100 people in, in a room for the weekend. We would teach them all the things they needed to be aware of to be ready to buy a home. And I would bring all these people who would get all this business from all these ready buyers that I brought in. And the only thing I got was a referral fee from them. And of you know the 50 people we brought in, the seven of them that were ready to do a loan, they were all mine. Right. right. And then everybody else got business that supported me. And they helped fill those workshops for you. Everybody benefits. Totally. It's the whole, the sum is greater than the, uh, the, well, the sum is greater than the total of the parts or something like that. I might've said that wrong, but <laughs> you're doing more together than you would have, any of you would have done on your own. And there's no scarcity there. There's instead it's collaboration, cooperation, and an effort to serve and provide what people need in all ways that they need. I think yes. that's really powerful. Yeah. What I can't emphasize this enough guys, because you have two choices. If you're growing a business, you can either Master the art of selling. And I got to tell you, 99.9% .9 of you never will, which means you'll be okay at it. And there's nothing wrong with being okay at it. It just means you won't be great, which means you haven't mastered it. Or you master the art of structuring your environment in a way that sales happen. Yeah. And that's much easier because you don't have to be a sales rock star. You have to be great at relationship building. You have to understand your client's uh, lifetime journey and surround yourself with people who help fulfill on that lifetime journey. So now everybody sees you as a center of influence and as a useful, necessary resource, mm -hmm. right? So like even in that mortgage scenario, maybe I got seven loans from that weekend, but over the next 30, 60, 90, 180 days, 20 more of those people became clients right? because they were just on a timeline or they were in the crock pot. And then we had all the home inspections. Every one of those people needed an appraisal, whether they were going to do a loan or not. All of my appraisal buddies that I connected, they all got business and I got pieces of all of that. Same with home inspections, same with whatever. And so it just, I it set myself up. So I was structured my world in such a way that sales happen. And then there was such a great reciprocal energy environment that those people would also bring deals to me. Combined with, even if it wasn't as a reciprocal nature, I had the upper hand because I'm the one who pulled these things together. Right. So if you didn't send business to me and you were just a one-way taker, or you didn't yeah. take care of them, if we said, hey, don't charge them more than this, and you did, then I brought in another person who was waiting because they right. knew this was an opportunity for them because I had the leverage. And it, was only, it wasn't because I was world-class at any of this stuff. It was right. because I understood the journey my buyers were on, and I know how to serve all the needs that they had. That's powerful. That's so far. That doesn't, that applies to 100% of businesses in the world. Yep. Oh, 100%. 100%. I love it. I love it. In fact, there's a term where you, the topic wheel, you take your product or service and you break it into six topics that combined mm -hmm. produce the need for whatever your product is. And you look for ambassadors in those topic wheels. Yeah. I think that's so powerful. And I think that the way things are moving, and that's where my next question is going, where do you think the future of things is going? Um, I think it's more on collaboration and leaning in. The opposite. So many people are running towards automation and that, and yes, we're going to use all the tools we can use, but still, I think it's about trying to be more connected, more involved, more human to human connection. Where do you think things are going to be in five, 10 years looking through your periscope? Yeah. My crystal ball says that the pendulum is going to swing so many times that we're going to be dizzy <laughs> and, and our, we're going to have whiplash sometimes. But at the end of the day, when I read my Bible, God created humanity and humanity created everything else. He created us for connection. He created us for service. He created us for community. He created us to help each other. And there's going to be all kinds of ways to do that. But if anything we're using is it, to, if we're using it to eliminate humanity, we're already heading in the wrong direction right. versus if we're using it to enhance humanity. So everything we do needs to be deployed to uplift, enhance, augment the human opportunity. And when you do that, it will be blessed, it will be supported, and it will be appreciated. I'm already this, I'm actually thinking about doing this as, a, as an ad or as a commercial soon, is I'm going to be on my phone going, no, human, let me talk to a human. I'm going to be screaming at an automated dialer who won't transfer me to a human because everybody wants that. Yeah. Because we're all sick of every company automating their yes. way out of customer service. Yep. So I'm going to do a, a commercial on that. I think I'm going to do an ad on that just to... I, I think it's so powerful because people are talking about, listen, they've been talking about robots replacing us. 
since tractors came out, they're like, oh, we're not going to need farmers <laughs> anymore. And then the calculators came out and they said, we're not going to need mathematicians anymore. And then spreadsheets came out. They said, we're not going to need bookkeepers and accountants anymore. And these are all just, we're already cyborgs. I'm using a microphone that you maybe can't see that <laughs> talk to you from the other side of the planet. We're on other sides of the planet right now, folks. I don't know if people knows that. It's not my biological being, but they're all just tools. And people are talking about, oh, AI is going to circumvent us and go, I don't know about that. There is a little, they've videotaped it. There's footage that when the sperm enters the egg, there is a flash of light. And they say it's releasing zinc, but light equals life. That's the moment the life sparks. Light equals life. You, there's no way around it. You want to call it a flash of zinc, call it a flash of zinc. But when life, there is literal spark of light. <clears throat> that is true. That is demonstrably true that at the moment of conception, there is a flash of light around the egg. And then from then on, we're not going to just roll over and die, <clears throat> right? Whatever that spark is, unless we decide to completely as a species roll over and die and give control over to the bus to drive itself, we're going to want to steer the bus. There's going to be humans around that are going to go, no, I'm going to steer this thing. And the bus is just a tool. AI right. is just a tool. All this stuff is just tools, right? So... I'd swear, I, I think the future is, like I said, I think the next 10 years are going like, to look like the last 10 years, but different. I yeah. just don't, yeah, I don't know. Well, and, and the key is the more time you waste being afraid of it or angry about it is just more time that people are going to pass you by because you need to immediately go, okay, this is a thing. How do I leverage this thing so that I can serve more people right. or serve people better or serve them more deeply? And the only thing I can't predict is what is scale going to look like over right. the next few years? Because I believe the actual, the next couple of years, scale is going to, you're going to be scaling intimacy and impact right. versus volume and width. Ooh. Last couple, last few years, it's scale has been all about numbers. It's been massive uh, increase because there've been more eyeballs jumped on the internet than it ever have been in the history of the world. And so people had to get themselves a piece. And now people are going to be craving human connection, clarity, yeah. certainty, they're going to need trust. They might need, again, another Google uh, study that I was just talking with a friend about today. 7, 11, and 4 is something Google came up with in a Google report. Seven hours, 11 interactions over four platforms. That's what people are requiring before they buy. Seven hours, 11 touch points over four platforms. Wow. What does that say? That says the absolute smallest percentage of people are going to buy from you today, right now. But... They're open to more. They need They need to trust themselves because they can't even trust themselves. Is this AI or is this real? Was this a robot or was this not? Is this person really, is this person made promises? Are they going to be around to deliver them? Yep. Over the course of seven hours, sometimes you can do that in a three-day event. Maybe right. you can do that in 30 days. Maybe that's going to take three years for some of the people following you. But right. they need to see consistency that, oh yeah, he said he does that. And guess what? Three months later, he's still doing that. Maybe he's trustworthy. Maybe I can trust. And here's the other thing. I talked about busting myths. No like and trust. I think it's bullshit. I think some guy somewhere way back, I really would love to know who's the first guy who said it because he gets all the credit and everybody else thought it was so good. They've been copying that for freaking decades because I buy stuff every single day from people yeah. and brands that I don't know, don't like, or trust. I just like the product because it solves my problem. Yeah. And, and that happens everywhere, every day, all the freaking right. time. So right. it's nonsense, okay? If they need to do anything, the most important part of that is trust. And the trust isn't that they need to trust you, it's that they need to trust themselves making a decision to do something with you. Mm. That's what you're striving for. Mm. Yeah. I don't care if you trust me. I care if you trust yourself around me. Because with that, we can do amazing things together. That's right. That's so powerful. that's the mission. And that, because of technology, is taking more time. Right. The thing we recognize, that was from a Google study, something we came across on our own study with our own metrics over delivering a half a billion dollars worth of sales results, 300,000 sales conversations over the last decade. Everybody we're seeing in the, in the post-COVID world is people are needing more touch, more time, and more incentive to buy. They just, you, there's nothing you're going to do about it. So learn how to deliver more of that. Give them more touch. Give them more time. Give them greater incentive. And that's going to look different for a lot of people. But these are the things that are going to move the needle for you. And that's where the future is going. And the beauty of that is because I know the ideal journey of my buyer, I spend 80% of my time, Daryl, having conversations and building relationships with people like you, people like Anik Singhal, who I connected you with yesterday, mm -hmm. right? People who can actually make a 
tangible difference in the lives of the people that I serve. And I'm building those relationships because I know the only way I'm going to have a lifetime journey that's really valuable and rich for the people I serve is I'm never going to be able to do this alone. I need people I can trust, who can trust me, who are on brand, on value, and we're all climbing the same mountain and helping the people that we serve. I love that's it. how business of the future is going to be done. I love that. I love that. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Jim, if people want to learn more, if they want to get in touch, what are the best ways for them to, to get involved, to connect? Yeah. Uh, you can, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to give you uh, scary. Let me, I'm going to give you my cell phone number. We're in the process of new migrations and new technology and stuff and all kinds of stuff is getting broken and lost every day. It's amazing. But if you text me 916-587-1900, Four, six. That's America. If you're international, that's the United States code. Text me. That is a Google voice line. So it won't go directly to my phone. However, it is on my phone and my team monitors that. So any questions that you've got, if you just want to find out if I'm real, that's why I don't want to send you to any automation. I'm going to send you to a text. Right. Text me. Tell me where you're at. Tell me you heard me here on the podcast. And I want to know what your journey is. What are you trying to do? I'd love to help guide you. Either as something I can help you with. I've still, I've done a lot of so I can, there's probably not too many problems I can't solve for you in 10 minutes. Right. And so let me see if I can help you or if I can connect you to somebody who I know for sure can. So people so I can be the example of that right away. That that's how so you should be doing business too. So to reach out, dial 1-916-587-1946. That is 916-587-1946. You can also look them up, Jim was it Padilla? Yes. P-A-D-I-L-A. That's P-A-D-I-L-A. Jim Padilla. Jim, this has been such a great call. People listening may want to listen to this more than once to get all the nuggets out. I've got a couple pages of notes. I think this is fantastic. I think there's so much gold in this call. Is there anything I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Why should everybody want to make the most money they can? Oh, why should everyone want to make? Why should money? everybody want to make? Because I, 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 there's this crazy trend in entrepreneurship where everybody hates capitalism. If you're not an entrepreneur, I think everybody except entrepreneurs seem to hate capitalism. Yeah. They fear it. They throw rocks at it. And listen, man, what's been happening on Wall Street and in Washington, that's not capitalism. No, it's not. If the system is not broken, the people engaging the process are broken. Capitalism is still, even as it's broken, the most incredible system ever known to man. If you want to help more people, you provide a solution that they will pay for. That is the economic free market. And it is amazing. And it will never change unless people are afraid to engage in it. The only way you're going to solve the problems for the people, this is my mission. We are all about creating a business revolution and expanding and, and empowering exponential growth. I have grandkids. I got five. Five under five and the sixth one coming. I'll have six grandkids under six. I used to be interested in you being successful. Now I am committed to you being successful because I need to ensure that we're going to build a world and a community that's going to, and a legacy that's going to empower my grandkids and their grandkids to thrive and own their own outcomes and destiny. And the only way that's going to happen is if more entrepreneurs yeah. own your destiny. You right. cannot do that when you're broke. You cannot do that when you don't have revenue and choices and options in the bank. You have options, then you're not victims of the government. You don't fall prey to what's going on Wall Street. You create your own economy and you change the freaking world for the people around you. And I need that for you. That's why what I'm doing does I do everything I can to empower you to do it and equip you to make that happen. I think I agree with that a hundred percent because before it was kings and peasants and entrepreneurship is what created the middle class. Master planners have not caused nothing but chaos and mayhem. Maybe there's been some good, but nothing's killed more people than governments on this planet and throughout history. If you either trust governments or you understand history and governments are a necessary evil, but that's why a lot of people want a small government because nothing has killed more people than master planning gone wrong, than poorly allocated resources because a small few completely disconnected from your community, your town, your neighborhood, make decisions from miles away, hundreds, if not thousands of miles away that impact your life in a massive, because they thought it sounded like a good idea. Whereas instead you empower the the local person, even if it's a nationwide brand, right? They all have to localize if they go into a different country. And so it adapts the locality and it's the whole concept is meritocracy, the most excellent rise to the top and people vote with their dollars. 
Every monopoly you look at, if you look deep into it, you find government legislation creating the monopoly that if without that legislation, there would be more competitors on the field. And that's totally. kind of going back to the heart of what you say. And that's where we, yeah, we need to be able to create our own destiny. We need to be able to continue to fight to improve ourselves, improve our resources, take care of our community for profit. I'm with you a thousand percent on this. So Jim, yeah, this has been a great call. I want to be respectful of your time. Give him a call. 916-587-1946. Again, you can also look him up. Jim P-A-D-I-L-A. Jim, it has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for coming back. Sending love to you and yours.